most vividly experienced the presence of God. It was on Mount Sinai that Moses spoke with God and received the Ten Commandments. The prophet Isaiah also journeyed to Mount Sinai when he was discouraged and fearful for his life. God spoke to him there, giving him encouragement and direction for the task that lay ahead of him. For Moses and Elijah, the mountaintop experience of intense communion with God was a one-time event. Its purpose was to equip them to be the leaders of God's people back down in the valleys, in the ordinary places of life where the presence of God seemed less vivid. The mountain was the place where God gave them instruction and support and then sent them back into the world. There's also in the Old Testament the vision of the mountain as a more constant place of communion between God and humankind. The prophet Isaiah saw Mount Zion as the gathering place for all peoples in the age to come. Listen. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hill. All nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning books. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The essence of that prophecy is still the hope and vision of our faith. That the day will come when all people experience true and lasting communion with God and therefore with each other. The geographic imagery of the mountain as a place of communion and God is really, when you think about it, very easy to understand. The top of mountain, heaven seems closer. The cares and concerns of earth fade away down below. The mountain offers a place of quiet and peace, of sanctuary or escape. Looking out from a mountain peak, one cannot help but realize the vastness of the universe and stand in awe of its creator. It seems like the world kind of stops spinning and time stands still. It was the realization that his earthly ministry was nearing an end that drove Jesus to the mountain. The time had come to set his face to Jerusalem, toward suffering and death, toward that bitter cup. A week or so earlier, he had told his disciples about the fate which awaited him in Jerusalem and about the similar suffering that they too would have to endure as his followers. Now Luke doesn't record anything of what took place in that week between Jesus' announcement of his suffering and this trip to the mountain. But I can easily imagine that the disciples would have been confused and frightened that week. And that they probably bombarded Jesus with all kinds of questions. Jesus, what do you mean about this taking up our cross? And I can well imagine that they probably freely offered up any number of conceivable alternate game plans to suffering and death. But when it finally sunk in that Jesus wasn't going to entertain any of those alternatives, each of those 12 had to struggle with his own private doubts, fears. Perhaps troubled, exhausted, and fearful himself. Luke tells us that Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. 
Now knowing Jesus' propensity for prayer, I doubt that it was the first time for any of them. But it certainly became a first time event when on this mountaintop something extraordinary took place. Right before their eyes, Jesus was transfigured. His face changed, shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white. It sounds fantastic, but that fantastic description is an attempt to put into words a mysterious truth that when people experience real vital communion with God, a transformation takes place. A transformation which is visible on their faces and evident in their lives. How and why it happens remains mystery. But that something fantastic happens is clear. Such people like Jesus on this mountain, like Moses on Mount Sinai, reflect in their own being the glory of God. Close communion with God empties them of themselves in a sense and fills them with God's glory. As Jesus' own transformation took place, two other figures also appear, Elijah and Moses. They too had known such communion with God. They too had had such mountaintop experiences. And they spoke with Jesus. Don't you wish there had been a record of what that conversation was like? I can well imagine them encouraging him to keep on keeping on along the path of faithfulness. Maybe they reminded Jesus of their own mountaintops which like his were temporary sanctuaries, brief intervals where they will receive guidance and strength for the road ahead. Whatever they said, it was clear that for Jesus, this mountain like theirs was but a momentary respite. This was no permanent escape from the world. Peter, in true Peter fashion, saw things differently. Lord, it is good for us to be here. How about I build three buildings? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. One can only, you can almost hear the gears spinning in Peter's head. This has got to be that alternative that we've been looking for. Who needs suffering and death when we can capture this moment here, commemorate the glory? Once we get the word out, people will flock to this place from every direction. They'll be able to come here, away from the cares of the world, and know the true majesty of Jesus. Surely this is what the full revelation of Jesus as the Son of God is all about. It's got to be. A for effort, Peter. But no dice. And moments later, even Peter couldn't Ignore the divine veto coming out of the clouds. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Realizing that they were in the very presence of God, those disciples hit the dirt, cowering, heads down. Get up, will you, Jesus said. Don't be afraid. And when they finally raised their heads, Everything's back to normal. They're there alone with Jesus on the mountain. The moment of glory had passed. Their mountaintop experience was over. So powerful, so mind-blowing was their shared experience that they didn't say a word about this to anyone. How do you explain the unexplainable? How do you put into words the inexpressible? At the bottom of the mountain, waiting, was a young boy seized and wrapped, convulsing and foaming. And Luke tells us that Jesus healed him. And then 
went on his way to Jerusalem teaching and healing as he went. For the sake of that young boy, and for our sakes, it was good that the transfiguring moment on the mountain was not the pinnacle of Jesus' life. What good would it do for us if our faith in Jesus Christ were limited to commemorating a moment on a mountaintop when the glory of God shone through the face of Jesus? A moment when Jesus experienced the fullness with God, but what if Jesus had bought in Peter's plan? Thankfully, Jesus was listening to God and not Peter. Filled with and transformed by the glory of God, Jesus came down the mountain into the valleys where you and I live and suffer and die. He came down the mountain to be with us in all of our days, came down to offer healing, came down to lighten our load, came down to take our deaths upon himself, came down to touch our lives with God's glory. Hopefully for each of us, there are moments in our lives when we too are intensely aware of God's presence with us. Moments of prayer or insight or comfort. Times when we are emptied of pain and doubt and despair and filled with hope and faith and peace. Moments of such clarity that the truth of the faith, the truth of God's grace becomes palpable and undeniable. Touchstone moments along our journeys, mountaintop experiences. And when those moments do appear, we have no problem sympathizing with Peter, do we? Like him, we too long to freeze that moment. To stay in the heights and forget about the world below where life and faith can sometimes be a, a dang hard struggle. We can't, though. Those moments aren't meant to last. We see now only dimly. And you know, if they did last, I think we would probably burn up. Instead, Jesus calls us to follow him back down into the valleys. Mountain moments can absolutely fuel us for a lifetime, but we can't bottle them up. We can seek to make ourselves ready for them, attune our eyes and hearts, but we can't demand or command them. Nor are mountain moments an immunization from down and dirty valley living. As it was for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, they are about encouragement, not escape. Glimpses of what is to come. Foretastes of that heavenly banquet, appetizers, but not the main course. We begin the season of Lent this Wednesday. Like Jesus, we will set our faces toward Jerusalem. As we begin that journey from ashes to resurrection, Jesus' obedience calls us to remember that the moment we commemorate as Christians is not the dazzling glory on a mountaintop transfiguration, but the hidden glory of a cross. A cross moment that signals our forgiveness, our salvation. A cross moment that offers us true and lasting communion with God. The road Jesus followed is the road that we too are called to follow. Not only because life leads us that way, but because that way leads to life. New life. Abundant life. Eternal and yet right now life in the presence of God. Thank God 
that Jesus came down that mountain. Amen.